Welcome back to Switzer and Australia's Business Channel. He's a legend of Australian business. His company started with one truck and a dodgy driver's license and now Lynn Fox clocks up the miles in nearly every country in Asia with thousands of employees. And the man behind this incredible success story, of course, is Lindsay Fox, who granted me this interview yesterday. Stand by for a very unique entrepreneur and a very unique human being. Thanks for joining us. How are you finding business conditions right now? We've moved fairly heavily into the mining sector in the last couple of years. That's kept us busy by putting uh, big road trains into the, the northwest of Western Australia and into the mining sector. And the big companies are still fairly constant with what they're doing. I think the smaller companies are having a bit of a problem <coughs> because the volume uh, and the pricing has, has dropped. But the bigger companies are doing extremely well. Right across the board, I think we're, uh, we're more than holding our own. We're, we're getting growth. Um, when you look at the Australian population of 23 million people, and you consider the rest of Southeast Asia plus India is 3.4 million billion people, we're in a situation where Australia represents 0.04% of the population in the region. So 20 odd years ago, we ventured out into Southeast Asia and India. And today um, we employ 36,000 people in 11 of those economies. Those are the ones that are growing. Our business is growing with all of those customers who are all global customers that work in four, five, six of those specific economies. And uh, in the next decade, our business outside of Australia will be bigger than our business in Australia. Lindsay, when you started, the vision that you might have had, was it what we see today, this extraordinarily big business? No, no, no. I think the easiest way to start my story is once upon a time. <laughs> uh, I was a high school dropout. Uh, my academic qualifications at Melbourne High School weren't all of that hot. Uh, I was lucky I wasn't an academic because I probably wouldn't have achieved the, the things that have happened to me over my lifetime. But uh, at 16, I managed to get my driver's license. I cheated on my age, uh, but I was quite successful at it. And then I managed to convince a, a truck wrecker, E.V. Timms, that in those days were in Collingwood, to sell me a truck on four 100-pound promissory notes. And that's where it started. From there, I carted 12 tonne of coal or, or coke from the West Melbourne Gas Works a day. At the end of the day, I used to look like Al Jolson. Uh, but uh, that's where it started. I guess the, the scenario of how to make a small fortune start with a large one is, is very true. But when you start with nothing, you're aggression and you're prepared to have a go. And that's what I did. But the formative years uh, were difficult. I didn't know the difference between gross and net. It didn't take long to learn. I didn't understand cash flow. But companies like BP in those very early years of business used to pay me every seven days, let me pay for my petrol every 90. And very early in my life, I realised that if there was no blood throughing, flowing through your veins, you were going to die. And in business, if you haven't got cash flowing through the business, you're not going to survive. And we had a, a, a basic principle. We wanted blue chip customers that would be in business 10 years from today. And most of important of all of the three where they had to pay their bills every seven days. What was the secret to how you went from small to this enormous operation we see today? People. People, personal relationships. No different to uh, any form of life. Successful football clubs come back to a leader uh, in the form of the president, a good manager, a good coach, and creating a team with a family environment where they all become interdependent but all function as a team. The, the aspect of a team of champions will always be beaten by a champion team. And I worked with employing people that I either went to school with or played football with in those formative years. And uh, that, that fundamentally was where we started. 
we had what was called the till principle. T is for trust. If you half trust them, you don't trust them. I is for integrity. If they haven't got integrity, it's your own fault. And give me somebody with 100% loyalty and 85% ability before I would have taken the opposite position. You're passing another fox. Where did that idea come from? The second truck. So I let people know that I had more than one truck. But you come to various stages, and I guess in the early days it was a matter of carting soft drink in the summer, solid fuel in the winter, and that got up to about five trucks. We then went to BP and started heating the, carting their heating oil in Melbourne, Sydney, uh, Canberra, Wollongong, Newcastle, and that, that grew. And the big turning point was probably 65 when we put one truck at Coles on a three month trial and that today is a business that runs over 300 million a year. Courage Breweries, we won the contract in 1968, which took our fleet from 30 to 60. Today we run 7,000 trucks, employ 36,000 people, and pay about $4 million a day wages. I get upset every leap year. <laughs> it seems to me, listening to your story, you're very well connected. How important was the network in your business success? Well, I, I think network uh, is plastic, synthetic and bullshit. Yeah. Networking you can buy. Friendship you have to earn and it's not for sale. I still see, recently Frank Bragg, that was the guy that signed my first contract with BP in 1963, it was his 90th birthday a week ago when we signed the new contract to take over BP's tankers on the east coast of Australia. I had him with the new chief executive and chairman of BP in Australia, and 90, 80, 90 was at the time. And this was two months ago, he came along and was there to witness the, the new contract being signed some 50 odd years uh, after he signed the first one. But Frank's been out of, out of business for over 40 years. But the continuity of friendship is something uh, that you never forget. I can give you the name of the bankers. I can give you the names of the people that signed the papers at Coles. Mm -hmm. I can give you the people's names from uh, Dunlop Rubber, all of them. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you their birthdays as well. Mm -hmm. And I still ring them up on their birthdays. Let's focus on Lindsay Fox at the beginning and Lindsay Fox now. How have you changed? No, delegation, giving people the responsibility. Uh, my children are involved heavily in the company today. My eldest son's the chairman of it. I appointed him uh, when uh, I wasn't feeling too well about 20 years ago. And my father died at 62. And the pattern of, of death in the male side of the Fox family was all around the early 60s. So I figured on my demise at that time. So he came in when I was about 55. That's 22 years ago. And he's done a better job than I ever did. You've had a strong association with the union leader, Bill Kelty, which was unusual, a, a business magnate and a union leader. How important was that relationship? It was consolidated in the early 90s. Uh, in the early 90s, my son committed suicide. He was 24 years of age, his wife left him, and he wanted a family similar to the one that he grew up in. And Bill Kelly and Simon Crean um, and I were involved in a thing called NetForce. At that time, there was the highest level of youth suicide in Australia between kids of 16 to 24. And in that period, they decided that they needed to keep me busy. So we went around Australia and we finished up getting 60,000 jobs for kids in Australia. Now, Bill sits on my boards. He is the executor of my estate. And in my opinion, he's one of the greatest Australians that God ever put breath into. Lindsay, when are you going to retire? <laughs> when they bury me. <laughs> you never retire. I, I think through life, you've got to do things. In the last couple of years, in the last two years, all I've done is work on the campaign for the uh, celebration of Anzac next year. Mm. And that's been very rewarding. We've raised just under 300 million so far. But they're the things that you need to keep yourself active in. Mm. I'm fortunate enough that I know most of 
are the key people in Australia that make decisions and I can knock on the door and most of the major in institutions in the top 10 of the company of Australia gave 10 million towards this fund. Now it's, it's interesting when you can knock on the door of the, the likes of ANZ, Combank, uh, NAB, BHP, Rio Tinto, um, uh, Woodside and all of them be prepared to, to write out a cheque for, and, and Telstra write out a cheque for $10 million. And all of that done on a wink and a nod and a shake of a hand. Lindsay, you've dealt with many political leaders in your time. And I wonder whether you think that the leaders of today need to be more positive and less negative and rather than fighting over budgets and always going against each other, actually doing something to really bring the economy and confidence along. No, look, I, I believe uh, politicians should be like VC winners. Be prepared to put their life on the line for what they believe in. A VC winner has his life on the line and if he succeeds, and he's very proud of his achievements. At the end of political life, you must have a great deal of satisfaction for the outcomes that you've been involved in. Today, uh, so much different to what it was when I first started dealing with prime ministers and premiers. I have a meeting with them today and they need three or four advisors. When I first started in business and had a meeting with the prime minister or the premier, of a specific state or a political party. It was one-on-one. -on -one. Now I have a meeting with leaders and I'm there with three or four advisors. Now, quite often uh, I use the phrase, uh, did you ask your prospective mother-in-law could you take her daughter to bed? And uh, one leading politician replied, no, we sorted it out I, myself. I said, well, don't expect me to work through a third party to get a, an, an outcome with you. And he said, I've got the message. So I, if that is a message that we can get through to politicians, to have the courage of their convictions, and if they are the leader, be responsive to leaders that want a one-on-one -on -one discussion, not talk to three or four advisors that say yes, no, or to keep sweet with the boss. They say, great idea, great idea. But in reality, it might be a disaster. If you look at the two previous prime ministers, um, I'm not sure that their advisors gave them all the right advice. Lizzie Fox, thanks for joining us on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. That was Lindsay Fox, uh, an interesting and very unique Australian. Uh, I, I remember I heard him speak uh, to an audience when the GFC started and there were a lot of very worried people in the room and I remember him saying that he just uh, received a, a new truck and he was very impressed with it and he hadn't been behind the wheel for a long time so he, he got his managing director and they jumped in the truck and they drove down the Hume Highway to one of his favourite diners where he used to go to when he was you know, driving a truck. And they went to the diner and they had a bit of breakfast. When he came out, there was an, an elderly truck driver standing in front of this, this new truck and, and looking at it. And as Lindsay got into the truck, he said to uh, Lindsay, he said, I knew things were pretty rough. He said, but when Lindsay Fox has to get behind the wheel again, I know this GFC is really, really bloody hard. That's Lindsay Fox for you. Coming up after break, the Census Business Index is a very, very good index and the CEO of Census will be here to tell us what SMEs are thinking right now.